Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm excited uh, to be joined by these uh, great panelists today. My name is Justin Colonino. Um, I'm a lawyer. I'm a, I've been an open source lawyer for uh, you know, almost 15 years now, which is a lot to take in for me. Um, and I've been at Microsoft for the last six, which is kind of still a surprise um, <laughs> for me, given, given the history of Microsoft. And I've been uh, on the board of um, the OSI uh, for the last two years and just renewed for another two-year term at our, at our last um, um, board meeting. And before I, before I introduce uh, the panelists or let them introduce themselves, um, I want to set the stage for, you know, kind of what an exciting time it is for open source and then kind of in, in the AI hype cycle um, as well. Um, I'm really happy to stand here, stand here and say, you know, open source is one, right? Um, it's ubiquitous across software development. The world has, has really realized that transparency, collaborative improvement, autonomy, and the freedom to use code for any purpose drives innovation and allows everybody to learn from and build upon what's come before us, right? That's fantastic. The open source definition has guided this for the last 25 years, and it's been realized. But we heard from Merco that like, with great power comes great responsibility. Like the regulators are here. There's the CRA you know, focused on security. There's a PLD focused on product liability. There's all sorts of other things coming down around AI as well. Um, and there's a lot of work to do in those, but the fact that we're talking about this and we're saying, and we've been in, out there talking to regulators, we've been out there talking to policymakers, means in some way we've already won, right? Like people are listening, they're hearing us, and, and they're hearing um, that we need to think about open source and the open source innovation cycle as we think about how we build software that's critical parts of our um, ecosystem. But, but then to, now comes you know, AI, right? That's what we want to talk about today. Um, two other building blocks on kind of how open source and open source development is one, right? The first is that even as there have been some closed uh, open AI things that have been put out there, um, we've been seeing developers put open source pre-trained models out on the internet. Right now, I just checked. There's about 335,000 models available to download, pre-trained models available to download on Hugging Face. And if you're like me, an open source lawyer, you're thinking, what are my clients internally going to be doing? How do, we, how do we think about ingesting those and putting those into product? What's the responsible way to do that? And at the same time, much like the CRA and PLD, we're seeing that policymakers are accounting for AI in the way they're thinking about the open, or sorry, they're, they're accounting for open source AI without definition <laughs> in their innovations, like in the way that they're regulating, uh, regulating AI in particular. So it's, a, it's an amazing moment, kind of the fact that they're even thinking about this, the fact that developers are defaulting to open at the, at the, at the um, beginning of this cycle. Um, is kind of like a dream from 10 years ago, from 15 years ago when I started in this space. Um, so that, that brings us to, to what the panel is going to be about, which is why does getting the right definition of open source AI matter? What are the challenges in that? And how do we both protect um, the transparency, collaborative improvement, autonomy present in open source with that definition and also you know, get that innovation cycle going, that open innovation cycle against this regulatory backdrop and, and focus on AI safety. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about for about the next 25 minutes. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Steph, Shashiko, and um, Astor to introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about their organizations and how they've been um, looking at this space. Um, I'll start since I'm to, to your right. Uh, I'm Stefano Maffulli. I'm the executive director of the Open Source Initiative. The, the organization has been maintaining the open source definition with the community, for the community, for 25 years. And we, come, we built the open source definition on top of the, the, the shoulder of the giants, the, the free software movement that started 40 years ago. Uh, and I think this weekend they're celebrating the 40 years. So part of that continuum uh, from, from the GNU manifesto to the open source definition, and that matters on AI too. 
Yeah, I was going to say that Aster stole my perspective, but now I real, uh, realize that I go before, before you. So, hi everyone, I'm Sachiko, I'm the chair of Open Forum Europe, um, and I'm also a senior researcher at uh, the Swedish National Research Institute, RICE, and um, I think for this panel I was going to let uh, Aster talk about sort of the policy perspective and sort of what uh, Open Forum Europe does in that space. Um, and the added perspective I could bring is, even though I've been uh, involved in open source policy for 15 years or so, I was going to take an outsider's perspective since uh, in the day-to-day -day now I work um, at the national level um, with public sector organizations trying to um, go through digital transformation. Uh, they're feeling the pressure to, to, to innovate for the, um, for the good of their citizens. And I can tell you that <laughs> I find your you know, introduction a bit provocative because you know, I would like to say that open source has won, and to some extent we have, but it's just that the world doesn't actually know that. Uh, <laughs> and that's, that causes problems. Um, I think, you know, uh, unfor unfortunately, uh, a, a large part of the people that we are um, talking to every day are kind of unaware of the fact that our societies, you know, depend on, on open source and that there's all of this opportunity as well uh, around open source collaboration. So we still have something to do. Yep. Crawl, walk, run, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I turned it on, or turned it off, just so I, I wasn't like hot miking when I was out there. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot to do. So, the doing part is what uh, Open Forum Europe tries to do. My name is Aster. I'm the executive director of Open Forum Europe, and we've been around in Brussels for I think it's 21 years now, um, trying as well as we can to explain the merits and benefits of openness in technology to different policymakers at different levels, so both the member state level, sometimes municipalities, and sometimes EU commissioners. And now we are, like everybody else, also wrestling with, uh, okay, but what does open mean for, for AI? So um, and we're often looking to OSI for guidance there, so I think it will be an interesting discussion. Okay. At the outset, there's a, there's a kind of a question, kind of like op open source of AI, but like AI is what? Right, and you know, in, in software, there's kind of the traditional, you know, source code, object code, or you know, source code, and then you know, packaged source code if you're in a scripting language. Um, but AI, there's, uh, it might be helpful to kind of start out just to level set for the audience. Some some people might be technical, some people may be less so, like me, and um, want to know kind of what makes up an AI system. And and Steph, you recently or with OSI have been doing a deep deep dive into both the technology and kind of policy around this, and maybe you could set the stage for us a little bit on the technical bit. Uh, it, it's been quite a journey uh, for myself because I, I didn't, I'm not a developer, so diving into AI was, for me, interesting to, to notice immediately how there are new components, new, new artifacts uh, in there, and I, I traced it back a little bit. It helped me understand the, the history by today, history, by looking backwards, and um, I noticed that for the AI systems, the machine learning systems that we, we hear about so much on the press, we need data. Uh, we need um, there are we need data. There are there are components that software systems that train that data and spit out mod, uh, models and weights and other parameters. And um, and after that, the the application can be applications can be built using these these systems. There are various new uh, components that are being built by by uh, machine inside the machine learning systems. And all these new components they uh, they share a little bit of similarity from when software started to appear on the horizon in computer science when um, legal systems started to become kind of uh, confused by uh, source code and binary code, and there was no uh, legal framework that immediately could be used and adopted. There was a policy decision um, uh, made to apply copyright to source code at the time. Today, we're facing a similar, um, a similar moment where data being built into data sets that goes into training a model and weights. Uh, these new artifacts uh, 
build, bring new challenges, and they don't necessarily fit into the legal frameworks that we already have. So when I was looking at the open source definition, I was looking at the 300,000 models on, on um, Hugging Face, the immediate challenge to me was how do these models inside Hugging Face, why do they use the Apache software license, for example? Apache software license has a lot of terminology that refers to copyright, th talks about source code. And what is the source code of a, of a model? Uh, when, when it's made of training data sets, it's made of, of model weights, parameters, uh, other source code software, software tools. All these confusion, I think, uh, made me realize that, we, that open source definition doesn't fit squarely into this space anymore. And that's why we, need to, we needed to look into this. Right. And, and just to... to play on the Apache license for a second, that, that defines source code as the preferred form of making modifications to the work. Do you have any thoughts about what that might be in a uh, AI system? Right. <laughs> source, what is the source code is the preferred form to make modifications, which brings us to, do we need data to be able, so data goes into training the, the model. Some intuitively think that data is therefore source code to the model. You need to have that in order to modify the model. But technically, not every model, I mean, some models, many models, can be modified by themselves. You don't need the, the data. You, you, you can give it new data and retrain it, fine tune it. There is a very, it's very new and, um, as, a, as a system. So the old paradigm work up to a level, not fully. Got it. So, so what I'm hearing is that there's, you know, if you're going to be building an AI system, you need software for, for running the model, the, the uh, software to train the model that produces weights, which are, are, are kind of part of the network. Um, and then you need the underlying data. Um, we might want to, it might be helpful to get a perspective, Steph, um, and Ibrahim, who's not here, <laughs> about um, how should we be thinking about um, these categories, how they intersect, and how we should build projects around them. Should they be built as kind of a monolith of you know, the data, the weights, and the code? Is it just enough to have the data, uh, just the data, just the weights? Um, what, what are the, what's a good way of building projects in this space, if, if, you have a, if you have a thought? If I have a thought. So it, it's mainly, it's what I'm seeing happening, it, that there, is, there are many projects that are being De uh, developed and, 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 and distributed with, with or without, mostly without um, data at the, so if you look at the very latest, like Llama 2 from, from, uh, from Meta or Falcon from other, you know, their uh, PTA from uh, Eluter AI is an exception, but most of these large language models and, and large models, they, they get released with uh, some sort of transparency about how they've been built, but not all of them have the, the full set of training data, uh, training software, uh, model architecture, maybe a scientific paper attached to it also that describes the inner working of, of the system. And, 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 and we're seeing a variety of approaches. And all of them call themselves open source AI at, at one uh, level or not. So there is a lot of confusion inside the, these, these environments, and that doesn't really help anyone. It doesn't help with the policy making. It doesn't help us with understanding inside, you know, explaining to, to policymakers in, in Europe and the United States um, what they should be doing, what they should be paying attention. So we're helping the community driving together a large conversation to start putting out ourselves a little bit of clarity. Okay, um, with, with that kind of groundwork of, of you know, what the parts of an AI system are and, and how they might you know, interact in a project, uh, let's turn a little bit to policy. Um, so I was excited to see you know, some discussion in the EU AI Act um, about open source. Um, and I'm also excited to see the amount of development, you know, like I said, hundreds of thousands of projects developed in the open, kind of embracing, you know, openness on some level, maybe not all the way. Um, 
just embracing that and, and, and living it. So, um, but Aster, what are you seeing at OFE from a policy perspective now as we are considering the regulation um, in the space? Yeah, I don't know. I think most of you probably uh, were here for Mirko's presentation where he went through some of the uh, impacts of the kind of current state pre trilogues negotiations of the AI Act as it is right now. Uh, and that's, I would say, kind of where we were and what we kept on seeing for the last year or so when it came to uh, open source in this space with relation to the AI Act. That's, of course, what we focused on at Open Forum Europe in Brussels. But, um, and there the discussions were, uh, you know, often very much stuck in the, the, okay, should everyone be able to access and use these things? Isn't that incredibly dangerous? You've heard the discussion, I bet. Um, but the thing that has, I would say, changed as of end of June, or we'll see how much it actually changes things. It was a statement by President Macron of France at uh, a large tech conference in France, where he, yeah, he said, on croit dans l'open source. Uh, we believe in open source. And this was a change of position. Um, things had happened. Um, the, the company Mistral AI got a large valuation in France. This did not go unnoticed. And there seemed to have been maybe a penny dropped. A certain connection was made in the LSE Palace that um, open source is actually very much in the interest of the economies that are challengers in the digital space. Open source is a way of scaling fast and innovating. And it is fascinating, like what Justin says, that the open source model have the level of sophistication that they have at this point in the kind of the market development. Um, and this has been appreciated by the French. Now there's whispers in Brussels of a 180 turn of France on the AI Act to make sure that open source AI, which they now believe in and love so much, needs to be protected. I haven't seen exactly what this will mean in the negotiations, uh, the French position, etc. But um, it is definitely a very interesting change of rhetoric around open source, away from the kind of standard talking points of how incredibly dangerous it is if anyone can use large language models or AI models for X, Y, Z, to this also has some benefits. This is actually very interesting in terms of innovation and competitiveness for, for European economies. So that is something that we're following very closely. And if you also look at a statement from, from Ambassador Verdi, uh, the digital ambassador of France, he essentially, you can make this connection to the infamous Google memo that you might have seen a few months ago about there are no moats for, for, for uh, the large language models. Um, he essentially made a statement where he said, well, we don't want to build a regulatory mode for the ones who are currently the market leaders. Uh, we don't necessarily want to pull the ladder up. You know, some of these companies that are just ahead now might want to <laughs> pull the ladder up behind them. Um, and these things are changing the discussions around open source AI. But here, and to really link this then to the question of definitions, um, what do they mean when they say open source AI? Because we don't have a definition. And um, if it's now starting to get a lot more attention, um, we need to get this definition right. In one way to make sure that they preserve the benefits that come with open source, as it then a, in a definition is extended to, to open source AI. But also, if we look at policymaking, we talked about the PLD, we talked about uh, AI Act and CRA, making sure that we find, get to a good definition and then stick to it is going to be very important because if I sit and communicate to a policymaker that we should protect open source, exempt open source, we can't have any questions about what it is that we're exempting. If company stakeholders start to be loose with these definitions, and start to not follow these expectations and principles, then the policymaker will over time turn around as, but what the heck is this? Like, we can't. So these definitional questions suddenly 
I'm very glad that OSI started this work already last year because we need to get there very soon. Uh, things are being put in print in loss. Uh, no pressure. Yeah. Oh, we're, we're supportive. Um, but this comes to the question, because I think here also there's no question. We can't talk about no regulation for AI or large language models. That's off the table. That's not what we're, we're talking about. Um, it's, I think we need to get away from conversations about over-regulation, no regulation versus regulation. It's really start looking into the right regulation, guided by the principles of the open source definition principles of what open competitive markets can do for you know, the AI offerings, the LLMs that are out there for the users, cons uh, for consumers, by extension for citizens. That kind of focus and that kind of quote unquote good regulation, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to for once get kind of an exciting um, uh, new market where open wins. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, Sachiko, um, putting your public sector hat on for a moment, um, how might a consistent in definition of uh, open source AI benefit the public sector? So I was going to first almost inter interrupt you, Astor, because, you know, as you kept talking, you stole more and more my points. So I knew already <laughs> that this was a bad setup, so given that we actually work together. So, um, But uh, coming uh, last uh, but not least, um, I think a, a definition does matter a lot. Uh, I think it matters um, for us because we've been talking about the, the importance of having an educational, you know, campaign with policymakers and public sector officials, and we cannot communicate effectively if we don't, you know, have clear definitions. That, you know, uh, that we don't know what we're talking about. So, and I think it's going to be needed because I think you say open source is one. To some extent, it has, but you know, new technologies come around. There are new forms. There are new opportunities for lock-in. Okay, every time there's a new technology, you know, um, there's going to be um, you know, there's going to be actors thinking, how can I lock in um, my, my customer into a proprietary system? And I think a lot of the logic um, that we have sort of been trying to explain around open source for the last 15 years or, or more in you know, OFE, um, it applies here as well. And I think um, and the opportunity is maybe bigger than ever because um, we used to want to say that okay, technology should move into the boardroom. Decisions should move from the back room to the boardroom. I think with AI, we might finally be there because we're starting to, um, more and more audiences, uh, they don't just say, oh, it's just technology. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's going to get to higher levels of policymakers, but also business executives that are going to say, okay, this is uh, not just technology. This is important for, like, um, you know, has important implications for, for, for citizens and their rights, etc. So, so what's at stake is, 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 um, is you know, it's just, just more at stake and um, the calls for transparency um, are coming from, from more and more uh, places. So the opportunity there for open source to come in um, and, and as a way to sort of uh, mitigate some of the concerns around AI, it's a big opportunity. At the same time, and uh, I mentioned just this just uh, during the break, what I see is that, you know, there is a lot of open source, um, there's a lot about open source that's counterintuitive to non-expert audiences. And this is going to be, um, going to not necessarily play in favor of open source because, you know, um, non-expert um, actors will say AI has a lot of opportunity and a lot of risk. Um, the, the way that we can engage with this is going to be safer to go with, you know, one supplier and the term open, even though they like the transparency aspects, um, it's going to sound dangerous. So we will need to, you know, um, create um, good narratives and, and analogies to illustrate to um, sort of the benefits of open source and you know notwithstanding the fact that it had the ball you know the penny has dropped uh, you know um, with Macron and, and France I don't think that it's it's not as widespread as that right so and um, so just like 
being able to communicate that. So just yeah. coming back to the definition, it is important because we need to be able to communicate effectively. So. Right, and that, and that transparency but danger is something mm. that, that people are Absolutely. gonna be hearing about. Mm. Yeah. Um, so just kind of going back to, to building maybe the right definition, maybe picking up a little bit on that transparency piece, Right, there's this uh, concept we, we were hearing earlier about how you know the code and weights are what people are sharing and then are able to kind of make further modifications um, to an AI system. But what's the right way to balance that you know, versus the transparency in the data? And particularly with data, what's, what's kind of tricky, as, as many, if anyone here has been working in the open data realm for some time, you know, some, some data no problem, but other data like medical data, which there's a lot of applications for AI around, um, that's something that's not very easy to share. And so how do we balance that transparency um, of, of how the system might operate, the biases underlying the data versus um, in that definition? If you're asking me, that Everybody. is... Everybody. Yeah, I mean, if I, I can start with that. I mean, but that's probably one that's the crucial point that we have to address. And it's quite clear from the early conversations within the group that is drafting the, the definition now is exactly that. What's the, wh how do we assemble a large amount of data? What kind of policies uh, do we need to write? What kind of approach do we want to simulate and, and accept for data to be shared, to be shareable without the, w limiting the risks uh, from the people who share it, from the groups who share it. Because it's not just a privacy issue, there is also copyright issues mm -hmm. that are being now challenging uh, the, the openness uh, or the advantages of being open. It, because parado the paradox of open, uh, Open Future talks about this quite a bit, it's a group in Europe. The, the, the fact that by being open, groups that have been developing large language models that are available for everyone to, share, to use and, and without limitation to study how they work and modify, et cetera, are at a disadvantage because they have exposed the source of their data and the source of that data contains copyrighted material. So paradoxically, OpenAI is at a, the, the company is at an advantage by being secretive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's going to be very interesting um, for regulation and for us as, uh, I don't know, software policy people to really properly at o uh, Open Forum Europe deal with, for example, the revision of the GDPR, which is coming up very early, by the way, for, for regulation. But um, also there, uh, just imagine how many questions we will have to be able to answer in exactly this. Okay, well, Yes, private data, mixed data sets. How do we deal with these things? It's going to be, you know, very, very important to get to. Now, when open source has won, we're also going to be expected to be able to answer these questions. Yeah. And as an ecosystem, part of it is everybody in this room have to solve the kind of collection, a collective action problem of looking into this, funding this research, providing the answers, finding the spokespeople. This is another element of collaboration that the open source ecosystem now stands, you know. Uh, so I was going to say that, you know, and some of these things can't be solved at a high level either. You know, you talk to policymakers and things like that. They're talking in principles. What you, uh, when you're working, for example, with public sector officials, um, they need clarity, but, you know, that, and some guidelines that can help them with their specific, you know, situation. I think. You know, this is a bit of a, a challenge, I think, uh, for us because it's not just um, it's not just highly sensitive data. It's it's also about sort of uh, I'm part of some collaborations like energy communities and things like that. And they there's just a question of you know who do I even have you know is this even my my data you know mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. this is is the kind of result of a um, a project where we have collaborated, where there are many different uh, sort of actors. There's the, you know, there's the consumer. There's the there's the energy supply, you know, company. There's like some kind of middle people there. There is it's not just sensitive data. It's like who owns this data? Yeah. Do I even have the right to, you know, is it even up to me to make a decision to give this this data? So I think we have to, you know, some of the work needs to be going into. 
actually some more painstaking work about looking at specific situations, maybe looking at, for example, municipalities or, or, or in certain sectors, like, you know, just try to sort of, um, uh, I'm not an open data expert, um, but uh, we will have to work with these people, yeah. right? And that's, you know, that comes back to like this, this notion about different communities coming together. You know, if we're going to have this kind of definition about open AI, we're going to have to also um, work with uh, the open, open data community. It's not the same as the open course. source community. Yeah. Right. Um, how do we, do, you know, are we speaking the same language? Um, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. things like that. Um, maybe in the last two minutes, um, one big one picture, one minute. <laughs> big picture thoughts um, from, from, from y'all. <laughs> what... We, we, you know, we've seen how open source has shaped the industry over the last 40 years. Um, what's your hope or expectation for the way open source AI might um, shape the industry? My hope is that we, we really gather these thoughts very quickly and, and we, 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 we empower society, we empower comp companies, communities in, in very wide terms to, to, pr to stimulate the progress of the discipline the same way that open source, the open source definition, the free software definition, have empowered the progress of computer science and software evol evolution uh, for 40 years. That's my hope. Maybe I'm hoping that, you know, um, AI will sort of bring open source a bit mainstream, that, you know, next di dinner party I can talk about open source and people <laughs> won't just say, you know, <laughs> oh, let's mingle, <laughs> you know, so perhaps these concerns will become more um, the concern of, of the everyday man or a man on the street. Yeah, now you were the one like taking yeah. the thing I was going to say. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think, uh, I mean, then I really hope that open source AI, and I really think there's a good chance of this actually happening because of the sophistication of these uh, uh, of where the, the open source uh, models are now, uh, we will see a, an AI LLM market that is competitive, is good for users, not overly concentrated, and all the things that have, let's say, haunted the many other digital markets in the last 10 years or so. And I really hope that we're not going to see that here. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Let's give a round of applause to our panelists here. And, and OSI is busy crafting this uh, open source AI definition. Um, you should check out it. It's at opensource.org. Yes, come, come see me um, on Tuesday and Wednesday. I have a office hours type of, type of thing at the, at the OSI booth at the Linux Summit, at we, the Open Source Summit. Yeah, we, we, we need help. Uh, this is a complicated problem, and it's important that we get it right. So thanks, everybody, for your attention. Thank you.